philosopher on, in the realm of physical computing. It's called Crossed Wires, Investigating the Problems of End-User Developers in a Physical Computing Task. Mm -hmm. And this paper is going to be presented by Tracy. Hi, my name is Tracy Booth. I'm a PhD student at City University London, and I'm presenting on behalf of my three co-authors, so Simone Stumpf and John Bird are here today, and Sarah Jones is back in London. So I'm going to be talking about a study that we conducted into the problems experienced by end users when developing physical computing devices. So the maker movement, the growth in DIY culture and interest in the Internet of Things is leading more end users to develop interactive physical computing prototypes. So the most, po the most popular platform currently is Arduino. And for those of you who don't know, with Arduino, users construct a physical device by connecting sensors and actuators to a microcontroller board like the one that you can see on the screen. Um, and then they program the device's behavior using the Arduino IDE and language. So platforms like Arduino make developing prototypes easier than it used to be, but end users still need to have or pick up some knowledge and skill in both programming and electronics. And they also need to understand the relationships and the dependencies between the physical circuit and the program. So our study investigated the problems that end users face when constructing these kinds of novel devices so that we can eventually work out how they can be supported. So three key areas of the literature have informed this work. So first, there have been decades of research into the problems faced by novice and end-user programmers and finding ways to help them. And, <clears throat> and we hope to extend this work to include aspects of physically, of physically constructing devices and programming them. And secondly, some of this work has been underpinned by work on classifying programming errors and determining the cause of these. And thirdly, much of the research in physical computing so far has focused on developing novel tools and platforms to ed educate users or engage them or to make building or programming prototypes easier, often by simplifying these activities. And we see our own research as complementary to this work by providing an analysis of the types of difficulties that people experience and their causes in order to help shape the design of future tools. So our study had a number of research questions, and today I'm going to talk about two of them. So firstly, how many problems do end users experience, and where are they located? Are some aspects of physical computing development more troublesome? And which problems can be overcome, and which are the problems that prove to be insurmountable? So our study involved 20 adult end user developers, 8 female and 12 male, and we recruited them from local maker communities and universities. They had to have some experience of Arduino, but only for their own projects or to support their own work. We gathered background information about their programming and their electronics experience and their self-efficacy. And they then did a hands-on physical computing development task in 45 minutes, thinking aloud as they worked. So we video recorded the task from a number of different angles for later analysis, and you can see an example here on screen at the moment. I obviously have permission to show these videos. Um, participants demonstrated their prototype at the end of the task, and then we later examined the program and the circuit for any less obvious errors. So, oh. Okay, well... <laughs> To give you a flavor of those who took part, firstly, participants had more experience in programming than in electronics or physical computing. That's nice. Um, they were, in fact, there we go. I'll do the small one. They rated themselves slightly higher in programming expertise than they did in electronics or physical computing. And most were self-confident when it came to developing physical computing devices. So they're not complete novices, but they do represent a good cross-section of the typical end-user developer in this domain. So I'm not going to go into more detail about this today, but it's worth noting that we found that these background factors didn't predict task success or the problems that uh, participants experienced. So the task they were given was to construct a loveometer device from scratch. So this task was based on Project 3 in the official Arduino starter kit. 
and creating the device involved connecting a temperature sensor and three LEDs to an Arduino board and then programming this circuit so that the LEDs would light up in turn as the temperature rose and then turn off as the temperature dropped. And they could change the temperature by holding or releasing the temperature sensor. So the program had to read the values from the temperature sensor and then use those values to control when to turn those LEDs on or off. Participants were given a task brief and equipment, but it was not a tutorial. They were told what to build, but not how to build it. And they were allowed to use built-in help and online resources if they wished to do so, because that's common behavior for end-user developers. So we coded the video transcripts on evidence of problems with a coding scheme inspired in part by Andy Coe and Brad Meyer's work on classifying programming errors. So we coded obstacles where participants hit barriers to overcome, and these were often due to knowledge gaps. We coded breakdowns on evidence of errors in either action or thinking, and we coded bugs for faults or errors that were introduced, usually in the circuit or the program. And as in Cohen Meyer's work, there could be chains of problems. So, for example, an obstacle might lead to a breakdown, which could result in a bug. So we first looked at whether participants managed to complete the task. Um, it was counted as completed if the prototype met the specification and it contained no errors that would affect the behavior. So only six participants completed the task, which was quite a low number, given that it was a relatively simple task. So all participants experienced problems. All of them experienced obstacles, all but one of them experienced breakdowns, and all but two introduced bugs. And successful participants had significantly fewer obstacles and breakdowns, and they also introduced marginally fewer bugs. Inspired again by Cohen Meyer's work, we coded where participants experienced problems. So we had four location codes. Um, we coded circuit where problems involved understanding or manipulating the electronic circuit. So, for example, not knowing how to connect up the sensor or miswiring an LED. We coded program for problems in understanding or manipulating the program. So, for example, not knowing how to declare a variable or introducing a syntax error. We coded IDE where problems involve the use or function of the IDE. So, for example, not knowing where to find the upload button or clicking on the wrong toolbar button. And finally, we coded circuit plus program, where problems involved understanding, manipulating, or interpreting interaction between both program and circuit. So for example, not understanding the sensor readings in the IDE serial monitor, or misdiagnosing bug symptoms in the serial monitor, or in the runtime behavior of the prototype. So once we'd applied these pro location codes, we could see where participants experienced most problems. Now, most problems related to programming, then to circuit construction, then to circuit plus program, and then a few relating to the IDE. And that pattern held true across all of the different problem types. So from this, we might assume that programming is where end users need most help because that's where they experienced most problems. But we then looked at whether participants were able to solve these problems. So unsurprisingly, successful participants overcame more problems than unsuccessful ones did. However, when we looked deeper, we found that participants who failed in the task but still managed to construct the circuit correctly overcame far more problems than those who didn't. And when we broke it down by location, we found that it was particularly true for problems involving interaction between the program and circuit. In fact, people who didn't complete the circuit only managed to overcome 35% of those circuit plus program problems. So this perhaps hints at a relationship between problems understanding how the program and the circuit relate and problems constructing the circuit correctly. So what went wrong for the 14 participants who didn't manage to complete the task? Well, one participant encountered an obstacle in the IDE that he couldn't overcome. Three participants failed due to faults in program construction alone, including conditional logic errors, numerous problems with variables, and several bugs resulting from incorrectly adapting code that had been copied in from other sources. However, by far the main cause of failure, and that was 10 participants, was fault in circuit construction. 
which implies that circuit construction is something that end users could really benefit from support with. So we looked at the types of circuit bugs that cause so many task failures. Miswiring components proved fatal for five participants. So, for example, connecting the temperature sensor legs or LED legs to the wrong type of Arduino pins. Or misseating components. As you can see here, if you look very closely at the top image, where one of the sensor legs isn't quite seated into the breadboard. And this affected the, the readings in the serial monitor. And not using resistors with the LEDs. Um, as shown in the bottom image, also proved fatal for five participants. Now, this was a particularly insidious bug which affected the temperature sensor, leading to unexpected behavior that proved difficult to diagnose. And in a minute, I'm going to show you an example of this. So the participants who failed the task due to circuit faults failed to localize these bugs, often misdiagnosing the symptoms. Several tried to address the problems programmatically, int introducing program bugs, and a few also introduced circuit bugs as well when troubleshooting by changing the wrong part of the circuit. So I'm now going to show you an example of this pattern in action. So in this video, the participant hasn't used resistors with the LEDs. Now this is affecting the temperature sensor, although he doesn't realize that. What he sees is the sensor readings rising quickly in the serial monitor window, and the LEDs lighting up faster than he'd expected. He just... Right. So on releasing the sensor, the readings stay high and the LEDs stay lit, instead of dropping and turning off respectively. Initially, he thinks the sensor just isn't cooling fast enough, so he tries to help it by fanning on it and blowing on it, but this doesn't make a difference. He also resets the Arduino board just in case that will help but it doesn't. He then assumes that the, pro the problem must be program related, so he modifies his program, which was actually perfect to start with. And this leads to him introducing new program bugs, which he then has to try and resolve. So at no point does he ever consider that the behavior that he's seeing may be caused by something to do with the LED. So despite his efforts, he never gets anywhere close to solving the problem. Eventually, he runs out of time, and he fails the task. So this pattern of misdiagnosis leading to new bugs has been observed in other end-user programming studies, and we now know it's an issue in physical computing. And it's also been suggested that end-users will have even more difficulty troubleshooting physical computing problems than in programming alone, because both hardware and software are involved. And our results seem to suggest that this might be true. Oops. So what does all of this mean? Well, the findings certainly suggest there are aspects of physical computing development in which end users might benefit from support. So we suggest two main areas. So first, we suggest educating end user developers in constructing circuits correctly. For example, guiding and encouraging them to, to develop and test their prototypes incrementally in units, making sure that the individual parts work before combining or extending them and educating them in other types of best practice, for example, following wiring color conventions, may also help make it easier to troubleshoot if they do introduce circuit bugs. But we need to bear a couple of things in mind. So firstly, end user developers are active users, so they tend to learn during their tasks rather than up front. We need to think carefully about how this kind of information could be provided. And also, some of those who failed the task had a fair bit of programming or electronics experience, so we can't assume that providing end users with this information is always going to help them avoid problems. Now, secondly, end users would benefit from support in identifying, diagnosing, and fixing circuit bugs. So a support tool could scaffold end users' knowledge, for example, by providing information about the properties and behaviors of specific components and helping them to interpret runtime behavior. And if an end user knows they have a problem, the tool could guide them in choosing and applying appropriate troubleshooting strategies. For example, isolating a particular part of the, of the prototype for testing. And it could also suggest appropriate tests and give guidance on how to conduct these. Situated support tools have proven effective in other end-user programming domains. For example, the Idea Garden and the Y-Line, which guide end-users in solving their programming problems. We could do something similar for end-users' physical computing. 
So in summary, we presented the results of a user study investigating the problems experienced by end-user developers when constructing and programming a physical computing device from scratch. The work, this work addresses a gap in the literature, and it's a first step towards establishing how end-users can be supported in this domain, so our findings can inform the design of future tools. We discovered that end-user developers experience a lot of problems in programming, circuit construction, and in understanding the combined effects of these. We observed more programming problems, but circuit bugs were responsible for most task failures. So we found that localizing these circuit bugs can be really tricky. End users can have difficulty interpreting the symptoms. Many of them were misdiagnosed and assumed to be program related. And this misdiagnosis led to new bugs, as others have found, and ultimately task failure. And then finally, we provided some initial thoughts on what types of support might be useful based on these findings. So our future work will try to establish effective ways to deliver this, drawing on work in other end-user programming domains. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Daniel Ashbrook from the Rochester Institute of Technology. I, I think I missed it. How long did you give them to complete the task? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. So that's a pretty short amount of time. Um, I'm, I'm a very experienced programmer and fairly experienced with electronics, and I was thinking, oh, that would be so easy, that task. And then I was like, oh, I totally would have forgotten the resistors for the LEDs. <laughs> I would have figured it out eventually, yeah. but it might have taken, like, this kind of thing has taken me days to figure out sometimes. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did your participants think they would have figured it out eventually? Like, were they confident that they could have gotten it? I know some of them didn't. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I didn't specifically ask if they would, you know, given a bit of extra time, whether they thought they'd be able to figure it out. We did have end users who managed to, um, managed to develop the prototype well under the allocated time, including uh, people who were less experienced. I think our most experienced user managed to complete it in 32 minutes. Um, and we base that time, that 45 minutes, on, um, well, firstly, that's the time given in the Arduino manual, but obviously that's in a kind of tutorial co context. Um, but we did some trial runs as well, um, giving people the, um, the task instruction sheet, and these were end-user developers, um, and seeing how long they took. And it seemed to be around 30 to 35 minutes, so we thought, well, we'll just do the 45 minutes. But yes, perhaps with a bit more time, yeah. Yeah. They might have completed it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Tracy. Uh, great work, Hi, Andy. Andy Coe, University of Washington. Yeah. Um, a lot of the a lot of the types of recommendations that you made about making some of this easier were about process, better debugging strategies, better construction strategies, yeah. doing things in, in units. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about some of the strategies and processes that they used um, without training, and what that gap would be between what they're doing now to trying to organize uh -huh. their process better. Okay. Well, firstly, we're currently in the middle of analyzing the data specifically for strategies, so, but I can talk a little bit about just what we've observed without the, the formal analysis. Um, and we saw a number of different types of strategies. Um, we did have people who employed quite um, specific um, test-driven strategies. So, for example, there was, a, there was one particular user who had a... He, had a, a miswiring with his LEDs, and he systematically worked through a number of tests in the location where the error was occurring, i.e. the LED wasn't coming on, and eventually he happened upon a solution. Um, we, what we saw a lot of was people tinkering in their approach to, um, in their approach to problem solving, just trying as many things as they could until they could, they could hit upon a solution. We saw very little of the isolate and isolate and test, you know, which is why we're, we're, we're wondering if you know, there's a way that we could possibly encourage end users to adopt that. You know, it would certainly have helped with um, some of the, the problems that we saw. So. That's great. It sounds very similar to lots of pure software-related debugging strategies. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Yan Chen from University of Michigan. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. I was wondering, um, have you, can you elaborate more on the strategies that the participants use to debug? I know you showed us uh, one of the examples that this guy is trying to 
could LED down. But what about other like other resources that they look at and uh, uh, seeking for help? Okay. Okay. Um, well, as I mentioned, we saw a lot of trial and error troubleshooting, for example. Um, we saw people rely very heavily on the use of external resources, you know, which is a very seems to be a very common pattern with end users. So um, people made liberal use of um, online tutorials to try and work, you know, try and work out where they'd gone wrong in things. But unfortunately, because they'd often misdiagnosed the symptoms, they were looking in the wrong place. So you know. With that LEDs and no resistors problem, for example, people assumed that it was it was something to do with the input. Yeah, it's an output problem. That so um, it must be either the sensor or it must be I've gone wrong somewhere in my program. So all of their their strategies for um, finding help with this were based on looking in the wrong location. You know, they could have looked they could have looked for for longer and they probably wouldn't have found any. But it it, it was very much a tinkering kind of approach to, um, to troubleshooting as opposed to a, a systematic software engineering type of... Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.